folks. This is lab fall 2019. Um, these are reviews for our lab exam one, lab practical one. Um, and I had been using our lab homework study guide packets. We had just finished the first packet A1. And looking at packet A2, um, a lot of this is visual, so I thought what would be best if I use the um, lab unit 8 PowerPoint slide, so we actually had some visuals here. Um, so I'll try to switch, I'll, I'll try to read some of the questions off of our um, chapter 8, unit 8 lab homework, and then try to find slides in the PowerPoint that would illustrate them. So the first one is um, the first chapter 8. Um, homework question is describe three advantages of heat fixing bacterial smears. Oops. And heat fixing, heat fixing, um, first of all, it sticks the cells to the slide. So when we add our um, liquid gramsine reagents, the cells won't slide off. Um, furthermore, it will preserve the cells. So once we heat fix, then we can stick the um, smears in our locker if we don't have enough time to do the stains. Um, it hopefully will kill um, any pathogens, so it makes it safer to work with the, the smear. And some people feel that it actually increases um, dye uptake, so that the cells will stain better. With regard to disadvantages of heat fixing, it kills the microbes, so you can't see if they're motile. Some people observe that you get a distortion of cell shape or cell size, especially if you heat fix too long, so those would be disadvantages. Um, with regard to, we'll just zoom through here with heat fixing, aha, and here's the, the heat fixing, some typos here, um, and here's a PowerPoint slide, this is slide 7, that describes um, some of the advantages. No, it doesn't describe the advantages, I'm sorry you guys, <laughs> we just described the advantages. Okay, there are some optional gram stain videos, if, if you like. Um, some of these definitely are just for your interest. Optional video links. Okay. Um, so then moving on to staining, um, what, what causes our stains or dyes to stick to our bacteria cells is that the, the pH at which we're doing the gram stains, there's a net negative charge on the bacteria cell. And the dye portion of our stains have a positive charge. So really, simply, it's just a, an ionic attraction. And then we'll see with our gram, gram stain, what happens is we're going to form great big crystal violet iodine complexes that will get trapped within the multiple layers of gram-positive cell walls. So that's just kind of some basics. Now, um, with regard to the gram stain, um, a station we've often used on the lab exam is to have the gram stain reagents, have them letter labeled, and then we mix them up, and then we have you place them in the correct order. So that's going to be really um, important that you know the order of the gram stain reactions. Um, and you'll recall in our lab summaries for chapter 8, it had the procedure for the gram stain. So recall that the order of the gram stain reagents is we start with our crystal violet, our primary stain, and that stains everything violet or purple. Regardless of what kind of cell you are, you're going to be uh, violet or purple. We add our sodium bicarbonate to try to um, increase the pH, and that will reveal more negative charges on the cells to bind more stain. We add the grams iodine, which is the mordant. It helps set the, the, um, the stain. And, what Graham's iodine does, it combines with crystal violet to make great big, big purple complexes. And those great big purple complexes will get trapped within the multiple layers of the Graham positive cell wall. Now, um, up through um, Graham's iodine, all cells will be purple. So Graham positive bacteria will be purple, Graham negative bacteria will be purple. Human cells would appear purple. If we were staining fungal cells, they would appear purple. The first step, and this is often a lab practical question, the first step where we see a difference between gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria is when we add our alcohol acetone, the decolorizer. Now, cells that have no cell wall or bacteria cells like gram-negatives that just have a thin layer of peptoglycan, 
The alcohol acetone, it acts as a lipid solvent, so the outer membrane will get dissolved of our gram-negative bacteria. Cell membranes will be dissolved. And because gram-negative bacteria have just a thin layer of peptidoglycan, um, when we add the decolorizer, um, the cells will dehydrate, and that thin layer of peptoglycan, when it collapses down around the cell, it's so thin it can't trap the crystal violet iodine complexes. And consequently, we lose the purple color from our gram-negative bacteria. We say they're decolorized. The same thing will happen with um, human cells or animal cells, which lack a cell wall, they'll be decolorized. Our gram-positive bacteria will remain purple, and also of interest, fungal cells will remain purple. And this is because um, fungal cells have multiple layers of chitin in their cell walls, and they too can trap the crystal violet iodine. Then following decolorization, we're going to add our safranin, our counter stain or secondary stain. This is to stain um, the cells that have decolorized a, a contrasting color, red in this case. So at the end of the gram stain uh, protocol, gram positive bacteria will be purple, gram negative bacteria will be red. Um, animal cells, human cells should be red because remember no cell wall and we would we would predict that fungal cells, because they have thick layers of chitin, should also be purple. Um, artifacts, we saw quite a few artifacts when we did gram staining. Um, if you don't wash the, um, your, your gram stain smear with lots of deionized water at the end, you might have precipitated dye. Sometimes you'll get these dye crystals that are confusing. Sometimes you think they're cells, but they aren't. Um, okay, so let's hear. That is the first um, page of the um, smears and stain homework. And then let's see here. We'll go over on page three. They're asking about different shapes and arrangements of bacteria. So we'll just do that really quickly. So ball-shaped bacteria cells, a single one is called a coccus. And if we have more than one, they're called cocci. And then if you have a rod-shaped bacterium, it looks like a sausage or a cigar, a single one's called a bacillus, and more than one's called bacilli. So we'll, we'll focus on these two shapes. Now, if when the bacteria divide and they separate, um, when we look at them in a smear, we'll ha they'll have what we call a random appearance. They're just scattered everywhere. Sometimes when cells divide, um, two cells will remain stuck together. So when we have two cells, the prefix we have we use is di or diplo. So if we have two ball-shaped cells, we'd say diplococci. Um, in theory, we could have diplo um, bacilli, right? And then um, other cells will, um, as they divide in two, they will all remain attached to one another, forming these chains. And the prefix for chain is strepto, so we can have streptococci, a chain of cocci and we can have um, streptobacilli. And you might remember that bacillus anthracis were gram-positive streptobacilli, and also bacillus mengetarium, um, gram-positive streptobacilli. Um, another example that we looked at was our Neisseria gonorrhea, were gram-negative diplococci. Okay. Um, some of these other um, examples, um, after lab exam one, we'll be we'll be working with um, a greater variety of microbes. So um, some microbes they'll divide in two planes, forming these little packets of four called tetrads. This is classic for Micrococcus. You don't need to know this for the first lab exam. And then other bacteria will divide in three planes and stick together, forming these three-dimensional grape-like clusters. Um, this is referred to staphylo. And of interest is only cocci can form staphylo arrangements, only cocci can form tetrads, right? With our bacilli, since they only divide in, in one plane, we'll have random bacilli like E. coli, we can have diplobacilli, we can have streptobacilli such as bacillus anthracis. And then one last thing, this isn't necessarily a, a shape, but we want to remember that if we have endospore-forming bacteria like Bacillus anthracis or, say, Clostridium tetani, the oval endospore is so resistant it usually doesn't gram stain. So they will appear inside the cells as oval non-staining structures. Um, later in the course, we will look at some spiral-shaped bacteria, such as the spirilla and the spirochetes. 
All right, so that, that was um, helping to answer questions on page three of the Unit 8 Smears and Stain homework. So just, just for some practice, you guys, if this was a gram stain, we have some, the, the purple cells will be gram positive. So here we have uh, gram positive streptobacilli. This could be, for example, bacillus anthracis, bacillus mingitarium. We have these little tiny uh, gram positive caucus here. These are randomly arranged or just scattered everywhere. Um, it looks like these are some, what are called vibrio. It's like comma shape. These are gram negative being red. Okay, so just kind of practicing both the um, describing the gram stain reaction and the cell shape and arrangement. All right, and this looks like this little concept map with regard to um, cell shape and um, gram stain reactions. And this is just a cartoon. We want to remember you guys in gram-positive bacteria, they have a thick layer effect of glycan, which when we decolorize, will collapse down around um, and trap the crystal violet iodine inside, so they will remain purple. And our delicate little gram-negative bacteria, they just have this thin layer of peptoglycan, so when we decolorize them, the outer membrane dissolves, um, the cell membrane dissolves, they dehydrate, and this thin layer of peptoglycan cannot capture the crystal violet iodine, and that's why they decolorize. So um, the steps in the gram stain, and this is nice, you guys, they have the steps here and the, um, the name of the reagents in order, um, the function of the stains. And over here, really nice, you guys, they have the color, what happens at each step. So gram positives remain purple throughout. The gram negatives, they'll be decolorized, and then we're going to counter stain with saffronin. So this is a nice... Um, cartoon to study um, the gram stain steps. All right, this is a, just kind of repeating again um, how the cell wall composition will determine the gram stain reaction. And again, this was just more practice with gram stain reaction and cell shape. Um, again, these are fungal cells, you guys, believe it or not. This is Candida albicans. And if they're growing, for example, in the bloodstream of humans, they can take on these weird, they call them pseudohyphia. But this is just to show you that fungal cells like yeast cells will stain gram positive because they have thick layers of chitin. So um, on your homework, folks, this is on page two. They talk about describing false gram negatives, false gram positives. So let me um, back up here a little bit. So um, we, also, we also need to know the term gram variable. So gram variable is when you, you know you have a pure culture, you do a smear and you gram stain, and you see both um, red and purple cells, and you know it's one, one type of bacterium. So we call that gram variable. And one reason might be that you have truly gram-positive bacteria. And what happens with gram-positive bacteria is as they age, the peptoglycan starts to break down. So when you decolorize old gram-positive bacteria, their peptoglycan has all, literally all these holes in it, so they decolorize and end up staining red. And that would be called a false gram-negative reaction. So with our bacillus vegetarium cultures, Lots of you had either gram variable results or the whole, um, the, whole sme the whole smear, all the bacillus vegetarium appeared red. So those red cells would be called false gram negative because they truly are gram positive bacteria, but they're appearing red. And again, that might be um, just indicating they're old. Um, those of you that had the mixture in the bacillus vegetarium of red and purple, the gram variable results, the purple cells would have been younger bacillus vegetarium, so they had nice thick um, peptidoglycan to trap the crystal violet iodine, so the younger cells would have stained purple, and then the older cells would have given you the false gram negative. You can also get a false gram negative if you add too much alcohol acetone. So that's called over decolorization. You can break down the peptidoglycan, wash out the crystal violet iodine, and you'll have false gram negatives. Now the opposite is possible if you have truly gram-negative bacteria and you don't add enough crystal violet iodine, you'll under-decolorize them and they'll appear purple. 
This often happens when we make our smears too thick. Um, so the, the cells on the bottom layers, they aren't getting enough decolorizer, so they'll remain purple, and maybe the cells on the, the top of the smear will be destained. We said, how will we know if we, you know, for example, in our unknowns at the end of the semester, what if you have a, a gram variable result? It's really important to know, are the bacteria truly gram negative or gram positive? So remember, folks, we can do the 3% KOH test, potassium hydroxide test. You have to run this with bacteria grown on solid media because you need lots and lots of bacteria. You'll recall you put a drop of 3% KOH on your slide and then you harvest lots and lots of bacteria from the surface of your auger. You mix it in with the KOH for a minute, 60 seconds, and then you slowly lift the loop. And if you see this sticky kind of translucent strand, some people call this snot, this is chromosomal DNA that was released when the um, bacteria were lysed by the KOH. That will happen if your bacteria are gram negative, have that really thin layer of peptoglycan they'll lyse. But in contrast, even if you have old gram-positive bacteria cells, the multiple layers of peptoglycan will prevent the cells from lysing in the KOH. So if you had gram-positive bacteria, when you lift your loop, there won't be that sticky strand. Um, the sticky strand, again, folks, it's chromosomal DNA that's released from the bacteria. So gram-negative bacteria, you'll get chromosomal DNA released. Gram-positive bacteria, you won't get chromosomal DNA released. Um, okay, oh, and this was just another example, you guys, of the KOH test. So this, this tells you, this is chromosomal DNA release, that's a gram-negative bacterium. And, okay, this, this was on peptoglycan synthesis, which you don't need to know. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, this is the um, acid fast stain. And remember, folks, the acid fast bacteria, the mycobacterium, they have that incredibly hydrophobic, waxy cell wall rich in mycolic acids and other lipids. And usually mycobacteria won't gram stain because they're so hydrophobic. So um, the acid fast stain was developed. And let me just forward one, see if I've got the, the, um, um, the reagents here. So this is our acid fast cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae, moderate layer peptoglycan, and here's this waxy layer. Remember we talked about mycolic acid, you know, 60 to 90 um, carbons, hydrocarbon tails, so really hydrophobic. So usually they won't gram stain or they'll gram stain very poorly. And let's see if I've got the reagents here. Okay, so the the reagents, folks, in the um, acid fast stain, the primary stain is carbofuxin. Historically, the way this stain was run is you'd heat fix your cells to your slides, and then you'd have a boiling water bath and put your slide rack over the boiling water bath. You put your um, heat fix smear on that, so you're steaming the cells, and this will cause this waxy layer to melt. And then dropwise, you add your carbofuxin. So all cells are stained by carbofuxin. It's a beautiful red color. And then you um, remove your smears from the steaming water bath. You let the cells cool, and that permits this wax to solidify. And that's key that this wax solidifies. The next step, you're going to wash with um, acid alcohol, hydrochloric acid. And uh, hydrochloric acid will destroy everybody's cell walls. They'll destroy cell membranes. The only um, um, cell walls that won't be destroyed are these nice, waxy, acid-fast um, cell walls with their nice, now solidified, mycolic acid. So only acid-fast bacteria will hold on to the beautiful carbol fuchs, and that's why they're called acid-fast. You cannot decolorize them with hydrochloric acid. So the acid fast bacteria remain red. And then following decolorization, you're going to counter stain with a contrasting color. So that would be methylene blue. So bacteria that aren't acid fast will be stained blue. Human cells would be stained blue. All cells are going to be stained blue except for our acid fast bacteria. And let's see, we, see if we can look at this one here. So here you guys, if I gave this on the um, lab exam and said this is a mixed culture, um, two different bacteria, and they've been stained with the acid fast stain, which ones could be mycobacterium? They would be the red ones here, right? And non-acid fast bacteria then would be the blue ones. 
So acid fast positive is red, and then acid fast negative is blue. And it's easy to confuse that with the Gramstein results. I think that's it, you guys. So let's see, did that cover? I think that covered um, page two of the unit eight study guide questions. Um, on page three, it asks you how to prepare and heat fix a bacterial smear, and that's gonna be on your lab summary sheets. Um, we've talked about the acid fast stain and the gram stain, and uh, we've talked about the two pathogens that are acid fast bacteria, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, and mycobacterium leprae, which causes Hansen's disease. And remember, you guys, those bacterial pathogens are really hard to treat because the waxy cell wall um, permits resistance to lots of different antibiotics. You have to treat the patient for months, sometimes years. Um, um, the acid fast cell, cell wall makes it hard for our phagocytic cells to kill the acid fast bacteria, so they're really hard to treat. And then, folks, um, let's see, I'm going to stop here. The next, um, the next um, set of study guide questions are on Chapter 7, Prokaryotic Ecology, which is relatively light. So I'll close this PowerPoint, and then I'll start a new one for prokaryotic, prokaryotic ecology. And what I'll probably do is do a, um, a screen recording of the lab summaries, the lab exercise, nitrogen fixation, and biofilms in the next film. So we will be back.